Good morning, Bridgepoint. So glad you're here this morning. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, so glad. I, some of you are thinking to yourself, uh, that doesn't look like Matt, and it's not. My name's Greg Tellison. I'm one of the elders here, and I also serve on the Dream Team, and it's just been an honor for me to, to be here with you this morning. I'm so glad you're here as we continue our series, This, Not That. And this morning, we're going to continue in our study of Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we're going to be spending the next six, seven weeks in this chapter of, of Matthew, reading about the gospel um, and what Jesus said, and we're going to be studying his the Sermon on the Mount, and it was the you know as we heard last week, Matt talked and gave a great message on uh, let love lead and let love in, and so we want to definitely continue on that. and he, And he challenged us last week with a couple of different things. He challenged us to to kind of you know it, it, we probably have heard these scriptures before, we've read them uh, several times, and uh, maybe if you grew up in the church, you have, and 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 so it may become. Uh, you know, like a habit or routine to kind of just read through it and kind of gloss over it and not really let it soak in. So this morning, I want to continue the challenge that he gave us last week, which was to really let Jesus make you uncomfortable this morning. Let Jesus speak to you afresh and anew and approach these scriptures as if you've never heard them before. And think of yourself as you're one of the disciples that are following Jesus and you're sitting on that mountainside and you're listening to him for the first time. And I just pray that I get out of the way and that God speaks through me to you this morning. And so the other thing is, is that he talked to us about last week is that Jesus didn't come to start a whole new religious system. He came to fulfill the law. And one thing that we know, or three things that we know that Jesus came to do is he came to show us God's love. In, in uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul writes that Jesus is, is God in full human form, and, and he reveals God to us. And so Jesus came to show us God's love. The second thing is, is that uh, he came to tear down religion. You know, uh, he, he came at the religious leaders. He didn't just, you know, uh, you know, condemn, you know, people for their sin and what have you. He loved those people. He showed them grace. He showed them honor. And he actually came out the religious leaders. So he came to tear down that religious system. And finally, he came to save us from our sins. Amen. He came to show us the love that only God can show. And so this morning, I entitled my message, It's a Matter of the Heart. It's a Matter of the Heart. Because really, as you read through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is really attacking and he's really kind of digging into our heart and what's really there. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about a few years ago, I went to the doctor. I was in my mid-30s. I know it's hard to believe that I'm that old now. But <clears throat> anyway, I was in my mid-30s and I was like, I haven't been to the doctor in a while. And so I went to the doctor to get a physical. You know, I wanted to make sure that I was doing okay. I was taking care of myself and making sure that, you know, I was going to be around for a while to take care of my boys and love on my wife after they're finally out of the house. And so, um, <clears throat> but anyway, so I went to the doctor and everything seemed fine. And all the, you know, check marks got checked. And the, the next day or two later, the nurse called and said, uh, hey, Mr. Tellison, uh, your cholesterol is really high. And, you know, based on what you told the doctor and everything, this might be a hereditary thing. And so we want to put you on a statin um, to help bring your cholesterol down. And so, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. First thing I had to do is I had to confess because I didn't, I wasn't really honest with the doctor about everything that I did. So my diet was pretty bad and I hadn't really exercised as much as I, as I should. And so there were things I knew I could do. But one of the concerns is, is obviously with cholesterol, what it does is it creates plaque on your arteries and then so that restricts the blood flow to your heart. And so if you're not careful, you can develop heart disease and have a heart attack. And so there's a physical blockage within your body that would prevent you from having life. And this morning I was thinking that there's a spiritual blockage that some of us have in regards to the scriptures that we're about to read. And, and I'm praying that God breaks through that and tears down that blockage and brings healing to you this morning. And so this morning we're going to be reading out of Matthew chapter 5 verses 21 through 26, and we're going to be hanging out there for a little while. So if you want to turn, if you have your Bibles, turn with me there. And one of the things that Jesus is talking about here is talking about murder being equivalent to anger, and as we get into it, and as I was reading it, you know, I, I thought about um, uh, 
a great book that I read back in seminary. It was by George Eldon Ladd, and, and it's called a New Test- uh, Theology of the New Testament. And I know it doesn't sound very exciting to you, but it was probably one of my favorite books when I was going through school. And he writes there in this book, it says, The Ethics of the Kingdom, the Heavenly Kingdom, places a new emphasis upon the righteousness of the heart. A righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees is necessary for admission into the kingdom of heaven. He continues, he says, The law condemned murder. Jesus condemned anger as sin. Legislation has to do with conduct that can be controlled. Anger belongs not to the sphere of outward conduct, but to that of the inner attitude and character. And so what that says is basically is the law just legislated what you should and shouldn't do. So if you behaved in a certain manner, if you behaved in a certain way, and you followed the law, technically you were adhering to and abiding by it, and you were, you were doing good. But it didn't deal with the heart issues. It didn't deal with what was going on with the heart. And there are times where I know, you know, I'm going to refer to my boys a few times, and I love you guys. And so I uh, just want you to know I got one of my son's man in the camera back there. But, um, but anyway, you know, so we can, they can obey me because it's the right thing to do. But it doesn't mean that their heart's in it. You know, like, hey, clean up the room, clean up the house. And, and they're doing it, but they've got a rotten attitude about it. And sometimes I'm the same way, Right? But if we love the Lord, and if we are following Jesus, then our heart gets pulled into it too. And that, that act of cleaning up the house or washing a toilet or whatever it would be now becomes an act of service and of love. And so then, then it's that expression of obedience. And so the other thing, Ephesians says, uh, 4.26, don't sin by letting anger control uh, over you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry and which gives a mighty foothold to the devil. And so our anger gives a foothold to the enemy within our lives. And when I think about that, as I think about when I'm having a, like a Nerf war with my boys or we're chasing each other hide and seek, and they want to go into their room and close the door, and I get my foot in that door, now it gives me an opportunity to kind of get around and, and, and shoot at them and stuff. And so we, we want to close that door this morning. We don't want the enemy to have a foothold. Amen? All right. So Matthew chapter 5 Verses 21, we're going to read verses 21 and 22 first, and then I'm going to take a little break, and we're going to talk a little bit. So, you have heard, this is Jesus talking on the, on, the, on the mount, you have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone you are in danger of the fires of hell. That's pretty, that's pretty profound right there, and that's pretty harsh. And he's saying right there, so if you are even angry, and he's right there, he's talking about an unjustified anger. And I could be angry with someone because maybe they did something that violated me or betrayed my trust or something like that. But it's not an anger that I want to hold on to. And this is, so this is an unjustified anger. Like, you know, when I'm driving down the road and someone cuts me off and I get angry at them and I want to say a few things and, and shout at them and all that. So <clears throat> what he's saying is you're, you're um, in, subject to judgment. And that judgment back then would be if you were judged, you would be brought before the Sanhedrin, uh, which would be a court. And that's, if you were at the, the highest, they, there are 71 priests that were on that council. And it was overseen by the high priest. And so uh, on a local level, it would be like three or four men that would, that would uh, oversee that. And, and so they would, they would pass down a judgment upon you of what, it, what you would have to serve. And so the other thing is, is that if you call, he said, if you call someone an idiot, well, in Aramaic, that's raka. Some of your Bible translations may say raka or raka. Um, and what that means is you, you fool, you destitute, you um, good for nothing, wicked rascal. It'd be kind of calling someone that. Um, and then the other thing would be is if uh, he says, brought before the court, and if you curse someone or you say you fool, you are in danger of the fires of hell. And when you say you fool, it's a wicked reprobate, destitute of all spirituality. So, like, you're really putting someone down when you're calling them that. It's not like, you know, in modern-day terms where we would say, fool, don't be doing that. You know, it's not, not that. This is, like, really getting after somebody. And so, and that fires of hell 
that's referring to this, this area outside of the, the gates of Jerusalem where they, they call it the Valley of Hinnom. And there they would, uh, they would burn all refuse and different things. They would burn the, the carcasses and bodies of criminals and animals. And they would do it to kind of keep their areas clean, but they would bring that. And that was a constant fire that was perpetually burning. Uh, it was also a place where, at one point in time, the Canaanites offered child sacrifices to the, the god Molech. And so it was a place where, you know, it, and it also referred to, like, the gates of hell. And so 12 times Gehenna in, in the Bible is referred to as the fires of hell. And so it was definitely a place of punishment and unpleasantness where you would not want to be. In Matthew, verse 23, it says, So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice to God. And so when you're bringing your sacrifice, what would you be bringing your sacrifice for? It would be a sin offering to the Lord. So as you're coming to worship and, and give your sin offering, and you remember that someone else has something against you, not that you have something against someone else, but someone else has something against you. Lay your sacrifice down. What, do we, what is sin? Sin is being something that's against God, right? And so as you're laying that sin offering and trying to reconcile with God, if you know that someone has something against you, he's saying, lay that sacrifice down because I want you to be reconciled to that person. That's more important than your sin offering to me at that moment. That's a pretty strong statement from the Lord. And so what he's saying there is, you know, it's like, well, what is it? What, what could be that, that offense that that person has against you? Is it something that you said? It was a way that you acted? If you're me, is it the subtext and the words that you didn't say? You know, is it, is it God addressing your heart? And God is saying, leave your worship at the altar and go and be reconciled. Paul says that we have the ministry of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He said we have that ministry of reconciliation. And so as we study these scriptures, I want to go back just a little bit in scripture to Genesis chapter 4. And I want to look at the first time that this happened in scripture, where we see someone who has anger that leads to uh, murder. And so Genesis chapter 4, verses 2 and if you can't find it, which I'm having a hard time myself here, uh, <clears throat> it's right at the beginning of your Bible. So Genesis chapter 4, verse 2. So this is Adam and Eve had just given birth to Cain and Abel. Cain being the older, Cain uh, kind of tilled the ground and, you know, he lived under the curse, right? When Adam and Eve sinned, um, God said to Adam that you will toil the ground, right? So Cain followed after his father, but Abel was a shepherd. And so it says in the second part, um, now Abel became a shepherd of flocks, but Cain worked the ground. In the course of, the, of time, Cain presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. Cain was furious and he was dejected. And so there, I wanna, I wanna just pause for a moment. So it says that Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. And I think about it, it's like Cain's like, yeah, this looks good. Yeah, that looks good. I'll give some of my crops to the Lord. And, and I, I'm kind of interjecting a little bit of my own interpretation, so I'm taking a little liberty here. But, you know, he was kind of like haphazardly kind of saying, all right, I'll give this to the Lord. I'll give that to the Lord. Yeah, that looks good. No, but Abel, Abel took the firstborn of his first fruits, the best of the best, the, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. So Abel takes the best and he sets that aside and he offers it to the Lord. Now, also, we don't know how Abel, you know, pre presented it to the Lord. He could have been, hey, Cain, check this out, man. I'm giving the best of the best. And then after, you know, God said to, to Cain, he, he rejected Cain's offering and he accepted Abel's offering. Maybe Abel went like, 
You know, you know. I, I, I have two boys, and sometimes one, when, when one gets praised over the other, the other one goes, oh, you look at me, you know, right? And so, and so I could just imagine Abel kind of giving his, a, a little nudge to his older brother and saying, yeah, I'm better than you, and, and so uh, maybe rubbing a little salt in the wound and all that. And so, so then, then God gives a, a Cain a warning in Scripture. He says, why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain, why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, catch this, catch this. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to gain control of you. But you must subdue it and be its master. Did you catch that? Just like I mentioned before, that if we, if we sin in our anger, there's a foothold for the devil, right? He's, he's saying here, sin's crouching out the door. Now, the cool thing is, as I read this, I was thinking, man, God is having a conversation with Cain. They're conversing back and forth. It's a dialogue, right? What, wouldn't that be awesome for us to have that dialogue? I mean, God speaks to us through scriptures, but I would love to hear God's audible voice, I think that would be so amazing. And I'm not saying that God doesn't speak this today. I, I, he does. He speaks in many different ways. But Cain was having a conversation with God. And if Cain didn't listen, I guess there's hope for me. That, you know, when my children don't listen to me, you know, it's like Cain didn't listen to God, but he was speaking directly to him. And he warned him and he said this, watch out, sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But Cain didn't listen. And what happened? Verse 8. One day Cain suggested to his brother, let's go into the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, Cain responded. Am I my brother's guardian? But the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. You see, it didn't just happen. Cain didn't just react to a situation where the two of them probably had an argument in the fields or whatever. It was premeditated. It was a thought. So the first point I want to leave us with today, that it begins in the mind. So our anger begins in the mind. It's a thought. And Cain had a thought, I'm going to take my brother, I'm going to lure him into the fields, and I'm going to do something to him, and I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to settle this once and for all. So I had a thought. And the second thing is, is that it flows from the heart. It's a feeling. So it goes from the mind, it flows down from the heart, and it's a feeling. And so he allowed his emotions, his feelings, his anger to take over him, and he lashed it out on his brother, and he killed his brother. Jesus is referring to to this, and he's thinking about this um, in Matthew chapter 5. And... um, and so God, God doesn't want that to happen in our lives. And so Jesus is saying that we need to have a treasury built up within our own hearts. We need to have those feelings and those emotions be fed with something good and pure. Are we, are we feeding on God's word every day? Are we praying? Are we spending time with him? Are we conversing with him? Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, He says, a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. The treasury is that it's a place where you store up the the things that are most precious to you. And so he's saying, out of the goodness of your heart, good will flow. But out of the evilness of your heart, evil will flow. You're going to speak what's in your heart. And I remember being challenged when I was back in college. I remember I I was really frustrated with someone, and we we had a little interaction. And and, uh, I remember her saying to me, Greg, you could tell someone how someone is and who someone is by how they act in their worst moments when they're kind of tired and and kind of, and out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks is what scripture says. And at that moment, my heart wasn't filled with all that goodness. It was frustrated, and that came out. And so God is challenging us this morning to make sure that what's inside of our hearts is good and pleasing to him. Let's continue on in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to read uh, verse 23 again. I just want to go over that. So it says, 
If you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice to God. Now he switches a little bit here in verses 25. He changes. He says, when you are on, your, on the way to court with your adversary, so let's say that that person has, is, is uh, taking you to court because maybe you owe them some money, maybe you owe you know, uh, them some of your time or what have you, and so they're, now they're going to take you to court because they can't get it out of you. He says, settle your differences quickly. Otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge who will hand you over to an officer and you will be thrown into prison. And if that happens, you surely won't be free again until, every, until you have paid the last penny. What he's referring to there is that last penny is the smallest amount possible. And in our culture, the, 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 the cent is pretty much worthless these days, right? And so that, one, that last penny, he's, he's saying, look, the judge isn't going to settle with you for that. You're not going to do time, and, and then all of a sudden you get out on good behavior. No, he's going to say, you, you're going to be in that prison till that very last penny is paid. And the third point I want to say is that Jesus is addressing here is that it's an outward expression. He's, 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 whatever's in our hearts is an outward expression. It's an action, right? So what does this look like for us? For us, as we're walking to the courts with our adversary next, it's maybe laying down your pride. Maybe you think you're right, and maybe on some levels you are, but maybe God wants you to lay down your pride. Maybe he wants you to lay down your rights. I'm do this. I deserve this. You don't know what they did to me. I did, you, they, you know, I deserve this. And so um, he wants you to lay down your rights. Maybe he wants you to lay down your anger, your frustration, your bitterness, your resentment, your unforgiveness. That's a pretty long list of things that some of us are holding on to this morning. The devil is known as our accuser. And, and he's going to say things and speak things over us and to us. And when we allow him to take over in our, in our minds and in our lives, we're going to head down a dangerous path. And uh, he becomes our judge and keeps us locked up in our own self-righteousness and our own pride and our own unforgiveness. And I think Jesus here, he's not only talking about a physical prison, but I want to go out on a limb and I want to say, I think he's talking about a spiritual prison. And how many of us feel this morning that we're kind of locked up in this spiritual prison of self-righteousness, of pride, of arrogance, of bitterness, of unforgiveness? And um, how often are we held hostage to those emotions and those feelings? How often are those things the outflow and cause an action that we may regret afterwards? Words spoken, you know, uh, emotions flaring, and, you know, and all of that. How often do we tense up when a person's name is mentioned or a situation is brought up where we just haven't let go of that? How often do we feel depressed and lonely because of a broken relationship or an abandoned friendship and one that you may not even know what's going on? And what happened? And so I guess my question this morning is, do you want to be locked up in your own past, your own anger or hatred? Jesus says, do not murder, or it is said, do not murder, but I tell you that if you have anger in your heart, you have murdered your brother or sister. So Jesus is giving us this morning the keys to get out. Before we get in, he's saying on the way to the court, Settle with that accuser beforehand. Settle up. As I mentioned earlier, God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. It says that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So what do we do? How do we move forward? Matt challenged us last week that Jesus is our model. Jesus is the, the person that we need to look to to lead us. And to guide us. He said, he gave us two points last week. I don't know if you remember them. He said, let love in and let, let, let love lead. Well, if I'm going to let love in, that's Jesus' love, right? And if I'm going to let him lead, then I need to let him lead me in everything. 
And so I think about what did Jesus do when his accusers were mocking him and they called him names and they spat on him and they beat him and they whipped him. What did he do? He opened up his arms and he was allowed, he allowed himself to be nailed to the cross. And while he was on the cross, what did he do? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. If anyone had the grounds to be right and to be and, and was righteous, it was Jesus. Sometimes I'm self-righteous, but I'm not always righteous. And so Jesus, while he was being nailed to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I want to go back to what it says in 2 Colossians, or Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. It says that Jesus is the fullness of God, living in a human body, and we are complete through our unity with him. Through our unity with him. So this morning, if, if, you're, if you haven't been united with Christ, if you haven't given your heart to Jesus, I want to invite you to do that, just to explore it. You may not know what it is. You may not know how to do this walk. And again, it, it's not about religion. It's not about rules and regulations, doing what's right and what's wrong. It's about letting Christ into your heart. And this morning, I, as we sang that song earlier at Father's House, I was thinking about the words, prison doors break open. And I was praying for you this morning that if you are in a prison, a spiritual prison, that those doors would be broken open and that you can be released from whatever it is. And maybe the question is, is like, well, Greg, how can I do that if I can't even talk to that person? Maybe they won't accept my phone calls. Maybe they, they don't wanna see my texts and, and I don't know if they get them or not. Or maybe they're not on the earth anymore. Maybe they've passed away and gone to, to heaven or wherever they are. And you're saying, I can't reconcile to them because they're not here, but I think God has given us an amazing opportunity to be able to do that. As we come to the foot of the cross and we lay our burdens down, we, we lay our sacrifice down. We say, God, I, I can't be reconciled to them this way, but I'm, I'm going to forgive them and I'm going to seek forgiveness from them and I'm going to come to you and seek forgiveness from you. And I think God just wants to take a moment and he wants to minister to you right where you're at. So this morning, as we close, I just, I just want you to close your eyes. And maybe there is that relationship in your mind's eye that, that you can imagine, you know, that it's just not right. And you know maybe you've done something and you don't know what it is. And there's a break there. there, there there's, there's bondage there. And so we just want to we just want to come before the Lord this morning and, and just seek his face. And say, Father, forgive me for what I did. And maybe I can't reconcile with that individual, but maybe I, I know I can come before you and that, Lord, you forgive me for my sin. And, Lord, forgive me for what I did to them. And if you haven't opened up your heart to the, to, to the love of Jesus that is, that is available for you, then I invite you to do that this morning, that you'll just open up your heart and say, Jesus, I, I don't know all of what's going on here, but I feel you moving, and I want to invite you into my heart to lead me into freedom. And I just thank you for that in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen.